I'm going to go ahead and, and kick this off. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate everybody showing up um, at this first colloquium series for NCSA. I think this is the, the, it hasn't really been a tradition to have a regular colloquium here, and we're going to try to establish that, and we have a to kick this whole thing off. So um, Bernie Schultz uh, is a very distinguished scientist in, in um, a number of areas. Got his PhD from Caltech, uh, from uh, supervisor was Kip Thorne, one of the, one of the first st students, I guess, of Kip back in the early days, right? And, uh, and over the years has done many uh, important works in, in general relativity, in astrophysics. I think you've written three books on general relativity or mathematical methods and so on. So some of you might have struggled through not, not Bernie's uh, book, but general relativity through Bernie's book. <laughs> Um, over the years, have you studied uh, physics and general relativity? Uh, he's been decorated with many awards. For example, uh, won the uh, Amaldi Medal, um, which is one of the most prestigious awards in gravitational physics. Um, the first winner was, was Roger Penrose. The second winner was, was Bernard Schutz. Uh, and I think that's supposed to be given to European scientists. So he sort of sneaked in as an American, I guess, uh, working in Europe. Um, so anyway, a very distinguished uh, career in science, and as, as the director of the Albert Einstein Institute uh, in Potsdam, which is a brand new Max Planck Institute back in 1995, um, Bernie was the one who convinced me uh, to move uh, to Germany, and in fact, that ended up being, I would say, the, the highlight of my scientific career, was working at the Albert Einstein Institute in many ways. Um, it's a fantastic environment that, that Bernie was responsible for creating and building. So um, one of the reasons why, why I was able to to have such a great scientific environment there was that the interests that Bernie has are very broad. So I remember talking to him not only about general relativity and astrophysics, but also about supercomputing, about algorithms, and early on about data. Uh, and in fact, I would say he was also one of the very first people in the area of gravitational physics and, and astronomy uh, early on to really be thinking about the data needs, and in, in, in this particular case, in the um, context of gravitational wave astronomy, how would people manage the data, how would this be served up, and, and so on, and, and what would be the algorithms, and so all, all aspects of this. And it, as we all know, data-intensive science has grown and grown, and um, it's become now perhaps one of the dominant areas of investigation. People are still trying to figure out what it means to do data-intensive science, but uh, that's it's part of the, the, the beauty of it is that there's a whole open area now and it impacts every single area of science and research and the humanities and, and engineering and so on. So um, among other things, um, Bernie and I uh, spent a lot of time um, not only talking about science or data but also going on ski trips. And so we've, uh, we've gone to the same ski area together every Thanksgiving for 15 years now. And um, on those ski trips, we've often brainstormed about crazy ideas like building new institutes for computational science or for, or for data intensive science. And in fact, out of some of those discussions, uh, something has actually happened. And now there is a new institute being formed at Cardiff University uh, in Wales, in, in Cardiff. And uh, Bernie is out actually leaving uh, the AEI or moving from Potsdam, Germany to uh, back to Cardiff where he will be spearheading the uh, beginning of a new institute uh, on data intensive science, the digital. The Data Innovation Institute. The Data Innovation Institute, right. And so he'll tell us about that. So look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for such a uh, glowing uh, uh, introduction, an embarrassing introduction. But uh, um, uh, also uh, absolutely uh, uh, a perfect introduction to what I'm wanted to talk about today. Uh, as Ed said, I, I'm in, uh, uh, I've spent most of my time working on general relativity, astrophysical applications, and, and certainly the last uh, 20 years on gravitational wave detection. Gravitational waves is one of these projects that you would call big science. Uh, we publish papers. Uh, when we publish as a collaboration, we publish papers with 800 authors. Um, uh, there's, uh, it turns out not to be uh, 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 not to be data limited, we, we don't have so much data, but we are compute cycle limited because the uh, amount of analysis on the data is, uh, is huge in this project. So um, 
uh, this notion of data science or data intensive uh, science or big data, I think big data is a kind of misnomer because a lot of big data problems are really big problems using data, big in many different ways. Um, and my experience is, is um, from these big science projects uh, and dealing with data. Uh, I wanted, however, um, uh, uh, point out or, or reflect on the fact that uh, a lot of the places where big data or, or data science is becoming really important don't have a heritage in the big physics projects that are usually called big science. People in big science um, that I've talked to about these things are sometimes a bit surprised by that. They think they've wrapped up the problem, uh, that they know how to do the analysis, they know how to handle data. Uh, if you're handling petabytes of data, what's the problem? Um, then, uh, but I, so I want to kind of address that question, what's the problem when you get away from the standard big science projects? Um, and so let's talk about the first, uh, the, the big science projects first. Um, the uh, LHC is the champion of all. Um, LHC in, in, in the Atlas detector, uh, the raw data byte, the raw data rate, that is the amount of data that's digitized in the experiment is one petabyte per second. Um, now that's an absolutely uh, horrendous amount of data and there's absolutely no way you could even get that off site, uh, let alone process it. And so what happens is that the detectors are surrounded by a huge array of computing uh, equipment, uh, a lot of it done in hardware, really, um, uh, that down-selects uh, events and, and data uh, and throws away most of the data until in the end, and this goes through several stages of processing, uh, but in the end, you wind up with um, uh, uh, a data that is stored and taken away and, and examined more closely by humans at a rate of about four petabytes a year. So that means that's a, that's a reduction by about a factor of 10 to the 7. Um, and that's all done automatically. That's all done without anybody looking at it. It's prescribed in the, in the way the circuits go. And, and the algorithms that are built into that uh, data reduction are based on what uh, the physicists in the experiment expect. So they're looking for a particular thing, and particularly the, the Higgs and uh, other uh, properties of the Higgs and phenomena around the Higgs, and they're throwing away everything that looks like stuff that they knew before, or the standard stuff in, in particle physics that doesn't seem interesting. Um, and that's a, that's a kind of a lesson that's, that's true in a lot of the big science projects, is that uh, one of the ways of handling the big data is, is, is to be driven by a particular question where you're, you're testing a hypothesis that's already there. You're not looking for something completely new. It's probably unlikely that the ATLAS experiment will find something that no one uh, predicted. They're looking at uh, basically at templates um, uh, uh, at, uh, predicted by the theorists. And so in, in this field of, of um, high energy physics, the, the theorist is really supreme. The theorists, like Higgs, um, uh, make predictions about what should be happening at high energies. And then the, experiment, uh, the experimentalists build these incredibly uh, expensive machines to go after those particular ideas. And it's remarkable, I think, for the Higgs that, that, the, <laughs> that, that what was, it was a simple idea, the Higgs, uh, so simple that several people came upon it at once but nature doesn't you know, always have to give you the simplest idea. It doesn't have to solve the problem you're trying to solve in the simplest way. But in this case, uh, uh, fortunately for the people who spent all that money on, on the LHC upgrade at CERN, that turned out to be uh, what they found. Um, another a big science project uh, that's coming along in astronomy is the LSST, the, this huge telescope that's going to scan the sky every night and, and, and just take snapshots all over the sky and come back to every place on the sky with um, uh, a cadence of about once every four days. And it's really a, going to be a wonderful machine for, for looking for transient phenomena. Um, that's going to be producing about uh, 30 terabytes a day. 
and so that's going to be that's very challenging. And I'm I'm pretty sure within the LSST, nobody really knows how that's going to be how that data is going to be uh, adequately analyzed. Uh, again, because one of the main things that people want is is to look at the transient sky. You can reduce that a lot by doing differencing between pictures on, on successive um, uh, successive visits to the same part of the sky. And so if you're just looking for transients, the data that you're looking at is very much smaller. But uh, it's going to have a record of everything that's going on in the sky. And um, uh, to adequately analyze that is going to be a challenge. Um, the Sloan survey um, uh, initiated the Galaxy Zoo, uh, uh, which is a citizen science project. The Sloan survey was a, was a predecessor of the LSST in some way. It did a, uh, a complete survey of the whole sky. And the idea was to go very deep and to look at the galaxies, look at the galaxy distributions uh, particularly. But they found, uh, not unexpectedly, they found that so many galaxies that they couldn't really um, uh, classify them. And there isn't a good algorithm for doing that with um, artificial intelligence. So they created the Citizen Science Project, the Galaxy Zoo, where ordinary people, as I'm perhaps some of you, have gone onto the website and classified galaxies for them. Said that's a spiral, that's an irregular, that looks like two galaxies colliding. And uh, you know, interesting systems are being, uh, were, were, were picked out and, and um, uh, discovered by uh, ordinary people looking at, uh, at those pictures. Um, so again, that was, that's, that's a, another attempt at, um, uh, at uh, coping with a very large amount of data. But again, it's, a, it's, a, it's something in which, uh, it's an environment in which the big science projects have taken the data, they understand the data, and they, they know what they're looking for, and then they have novel and creative ways of, uh, of, of doing that analysis. Um, so analytics is a big aspect of big data, and the analysis uh, that goes on um, uh, in big science is also pioneering. It's not just the data volumes, it's the uh, huge amount of analysis that these projects are doing. Um, the Galaxy Zoo um, uh, uses human-based uh, 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 techniques because artificial intelligence didn't really seem to work. Um, the LHC is using artificial intelligence built into these uh, uh, trigger circuits that reduce the data volume by factors of 10 to the 7. And uh, it appears to work in terms of getting down to the Higgs. We don't know what's being thrown away. But uh, um, uh, it's, it's uh, working in terms of the goal of what the LHC was supposed to do. Um, LIGO, uh, the gravitational wave uh, system here in the United States, and uh, which I'm uh, a, a part of, and, and also its partner uh, det uh, detector project in uh, Italy, the Virgo um, uh, project. They have much smaller data sets, as I said. The, there are only one, one stream that's being sampled at uh, 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 acoustic frequencies, and so, uh, and then there's a lot of housekeeping data around, around the instruments. But compared to the previous amounts of uh, data, it's, it's of the order of a few terabytes per year instead of a few terabytes per day. Um, but, the, but the analysis is, again, really demanding. And the analysis is um, reminiscent of what I was saying about the LHC with the gravitational wave projects, we have an idea of what we're looking for. We're looking for particular waveforms, particular signals that may come from binary stars or from binary black holes, and particularly in the last stages before, as, as they're spiraling together and merging. And um, if you have such a very precise prediction, you can dig into the noise. And the sensitivity of these detectors is, is achieved by um, uh, Burrowing down into the noise, and so there's a, a, a effectively a, a way of throwing away data, but but the data in this case is instrumental noise, so it's not thought to be very interesting, and looking for the very weak signals inside. Again, with um, with a technique like that, we may be missing things that we didn't expect. We are much less sensitive to signals that we we don't expect than to ones that we do, and. Uh, um, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, probably uh, 
something that, that we'll have to wait for, a sec for another generation of detectors before we really begin exploring the gravitational wave sky uh, without pre preconceived ideas uh, and with enough sensitivity to see things that we don't really expect. In the beginning, we'll be looking for things that we do expect. Um, the most demanding of those things, uh, I talked about the spiraling, the, the uh, stars spiraling together. Well, that, those signals are very short. There are, there's a large parameter space for such signals, so there's lots of uh, signals we look for, and that's why it's the, the analysis is very um, uh, intensive, but um, uh, the signals are short. The most intensive analysis is, is long duration signals from what we call gravitational wave pulsars, which are spinning neutron stars that may be just e emitting gravitational waves continuously, very, very weakly. There you have to dig down into the data and probably integrate coherently for months before you get enough signal out of, out of the noise. And with that kind of integration time on a, uh, on a detector that's built on the Earth and sitting on the Earth and is therefore participating in the rotation of the Earth and the or orbiting of the Earth around the Sun, there's a huge amount of uh, phase modulation imposed on the signal. And that depends upon the location of the signal in the sky. And, the, and it turns out that every square arc second on the sky has to be searched separately um, uh, uh, through uh, for, for signals of several months duration. And that's what, again, causes the analysis to be intensive. That analysis has been offloaded to Einstein at home, and that's another uh, citizen science project. Um, uh, it's a screensaver. Maybe some of you already know, know it, have used it. We're getting from the people around the world who are running Einstein at home on their own computers and on their own laptops, we're getting about a petaflop. Uh, continuously. It's an enormous uh, computing resource for us. Um, it's not like having a petaflop here uh, in, in this building because when you run your program in this building, you get the, you get the results back right away. We have, to, we have a lot of latency um, with this distributed network, but nevertheless, we're getting uh, a huge amount of analysis. And um, uh, the other thing it's doing for us, of course, is it's saving us all the cost of all the electricity of running all those processes that are giving us the one petaflop. Um, so that's the kind of analysis that's going on in, in uh, a few of these projects that I would call big science projects. Um, but is this, a, is this really a good example of uh, the whole challenge of uh, data intensive science? Uh, I would like to argue that it's not, and, um, and that's I want to argue that it's a much broader problem that we're facing with, um, uh, with data intensive science. The uh, big science projects have a number of very specific properties which makes their problem easier to deal with, uh, despite the fact that it's challenging in, in a sort of hardware sense. Uh, typically, the projects construct their own instruments they understand the data, they control the form uh, and the quality of the data that comes out, they understand the data quality. Um, the experiments are designed to answer specific questions. Um, and so uh, as soon as you've done the analysis, you also know what the analysis means. You're extracting, in one, in one sense, you're just extracting, let's say for the Higgs, you're extracting uh, very interesting uh, collisions that, that took place in, inside the detector. Uh, but you already know what those collisions mean to you. So the analysis leads immediately to the, to the result of the experiment. And a lot of the unwanted data is, is uh, thrown away. Um, also, the analysis methods are well understood. All these projects have heritage. And uh, the methods have been built up over uh, decades. And um, uh, the uh, uh, methods have been de developed along with a design and experiment. You build an experiment, but at the same time, there are people in your project thinking, how am I going to handle that data? Um, none of those things apply to lots of uh, uh, big data uh, challenges now uh, outside of what we traditionally might call big science. Um, in lots of different fields, and, and you can think... Uh, uh, medicine, you can think psychology, you can think sociology, you can think um, even, even things like uh, climate research and meteorology, which are uh, you know, physical sciences. 
they have much less controlled data sources. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, for, for meteorology, there's, there are buoys out in the ocean that are transmitting data. There are, there are people doing um, uh, look, their, their, their information coming from local weather stations and so on. You don't have very much control over the quality. You have to, when you combine all these data, you have to weight them according to some judgment about how important or significant uh, they are in terms of influencing your analysis. So these are things which uh, uh, make these problems a bit uh, more complex. Uh, in many cases, the data are not well characterized uh, or understood, um, the, and that applies more and more if you go into the sort of data that comes from human-based uh, projects, uh, sociology and medicine and so on. Um, you can have a, a, a heterogeneous data set, um, uh, which is, again, the meteorology example that I, that I gave, but in many other fields, you're combining data that it refers to different aspects of a problem, and it's very hard sometimes, if you don't have a very good model, mathematical model, it's very hard to um, uh, understand the confidence, the relative confidence you should apply to different parts of those data sets. Um, and the analysis begins without a clear goal sometimes. Sometimes people are just doing data mining or trying to discover patterns. Um, uh, I know a, a, a project in uh, brain research at Cardiff University, which is where I've been talking to people uh, about their data, uh, their, their application problems in data uh, science. And uh, there's a brain research project where they're trying to, trying to approach the brain uh, from two different scales. They're doing large-scale scans of, of the activity uh, in, the, in the brain, um, and then they're doing uh, molecular analysis of, uh, uh, of brain cells and, and trying to understand function. Um, they hope to connect those two somehow, but they don't have a very good model. So the idea of all the data they're get, getting isn't to, get a, um, isn't, to, isn't to measure a number, uh, determine the age of the universe or, or how many galaxies there are per cubic megaparsec or something, their um, uh, idea is to, uh, try to try to extract from their data a mathematical model that might, might uh, represent brain function. And um, that's a much fuzzier goal. That's, that's that kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't even uh, lead you to a clear uh, form of analytics in that kind of problem. Um, one way people approach that is, is through looking for correlations in the data, and people in this brain project will be looking for correlations between things they see in scans and chemical changes they see in, in the cells. Um, but even if you find these correlations, what do they mean? Are they chance correlations? Uh, where is the cause? Where is the effect? Um, like I said, with LHC, when we get the right collisions that tell us the Higgs. We're not just seeing collisions, we're, we're understanding what that means in terms of particle physics. But in, uh, in many other fields, the presence of a, the mere presence of a significant correlation doesn't really tell you what, uh, what meaning uh, you're extracting from, from the data. Uh, and that's a, that's a real, that's a problem that's not, all, that's not always understood by the people doing the, the analysis. Uh, they find, they're, they're happy to find correlations, but, but when you ask them what they, what they really un understand about it, it's not so clear. Another feature, I think, that, that, that we've seen recently in these big um, data challenges is that uh, uh, there's a very significant input from the large commercial companies, in particular Google, for example. Um, uh, they've done some very important work on uh, methods for handling data, on creating new kinds of database, um, uh, databases, and new formats for databases, and so on. Um, and these have got back into, and these have been very useful going back into more academic problems. Um, but it's also true that the, that the priorities at uh, Google are not the same uh, as you have in academic fields, in particular, they have all their data. They control all the data. So they don't uh, worry too much about data access uh, issues. They don't worry about uh, uh, understand about uh, sort of having uh, uh, metadata that will, uh, other people can understand about how 
the quality of the data and how the data should be used and so on. So um, uh, uh, it's some, uh, some of the input from big companies is very important, but sometimes it also distorts the priorities and uh, doesn't match up with what, uh, um, what people want in, uh, in more academic problems. Um, so uh, this is a, a slide that is probably uh, really too busy, but I, I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, I was told I could have a, a pointer, but I think it's not working because of the way uh, I'm getting uh, my screen here. But um, let's just go through it a little bit. I, 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 I've tried to put a number of dimensions. Each of these lines uh, is, a, is a dimension in the data problem. And uh, on, the one, on one hand, uh, well, there's, there's the two extremes of the, of the dimensions. So on the first line, the first line is, is about uh, whether the data is, is structured or not. And on the one hand, you could have a well-structured data set that you understand, and like in physics projects that you've taken. And on the other hand, you may have a very highly heterogeneous data set. Um, the second line is, is, whether, uh, is about metadata. You may be able to, to ha you may have a problem that's simple enough to generate uh, uh, useful metadata automatically, or you may have a very complex data set with a, which should have, should be accompanied by metadata, um, but it may be very difficult to generate that metadata, and people uh, often don't. You uh, uh, then, then we go down to the next line. There's there's uh, data that you take once and it's just static, but then there's uh, data that's dynamically changing. If you're monitoring something uh, in, in society, for example, um, uh, that uh, is constantly changing, it may be that that's the most important aspect of the data. You have data uh, acquired under control conditions. I've talked about that. And on the other extreme, you have crowdsourced data that's going into a lot of sociology projects. Um, you have centrally managed databases or you have distributed data. That's, um, uh, and if there's distributed data, it may be that no one, one uh, organization is responsible for cur curation of the data. And you may not even be guaranteed that that data is going to be around or available uh, next year. So um, uh, uh, that brings new kinds of challenges. There's uh, data where the computational analysis, the analytics is rel relatively simple. I don't mean trivial, I just mean it's well understood. It may be computationally demanding. Um, but um, it, uh, uh, it's relatively simple. But then there could be data that needs massive computing just to, just to, to make any impact at all on it. The data that are used raw or data that are understandable only after processing. And the physics projects are very good at, re, at, at changing raw data into something that's understandable. Um, it could be your data is purely numerical, um, or, but it could be at the other extreme pure text data. There's a lot of pro projects in the humanities that are uh, mining vast uh, text databases now um, and, and trying, to under, trying to extract meaning from, from what they find. Uh, knowledgeable data communities, we certainly in physics have a knowledgeable data community. In many of the communities that are being overwhelmed by, by big data, there's no heritage and people really uh, are baffled even by rel things that would seem to us in the physics community to be, to be relatively simple. Um, also in the physics community, I think there's a, there's a history of trust. Um, people understand what to do with data and the people understand if, data, if things are confidential, they have to be kept confidential. Uh, there are teams that share data and, and, and share credit and there's a sort of well understood um, uh, trust network. You couldn't have a, a, a collaboration with a thousand people unless you people bought into the idea of working together with some degree of trust. Um, but there are communities with no tradition of that, where, where people have never worked in, in, in teams of more than two or three, and where, there's, uh, where the way you get ahead in the academic world is by uh, getting there first and, and not working with other people. And that is an inhibition to, uh, to working with big data. There may even be distrust because of, uh, because of a heritage of, uh, of uh, disputes and, and many, many of the uh, softer sciences uh, where, 
where people are get ahead by making big theories that are not easily supported, or, you know, where there's not a lot of support in, in the data. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of rivalry and distrust. Um, there's, uh, the, getting toward the bottom, there's open data. And, and, and this is something that's a big theme now in the United States and in, in uh, Europe to some extent, uh, that data taken by, by experiments using public funding should be open. But there's uh, a lot of data that is not open, some of it for good reasons of, of uh, personal privacy, others because the, it's been taken by, by on, with the financial support of private companies who want to use that data for their own purposes and don't want it in the public domain. Um, and so uh, that creates, again, that creates problems in, in the analysis of the data. Uh, you can have data that's impersonal, like in physics, or you can have data that has a lot of privacy issues, um, as in medicine. Um, and uh, you can have um, data that's generated, as, a, as I said, through private en endeavors or data that comes from public funding. Um, so all of these things uh, um, uh, are uh, different dimensions, and typically the, the, the sort of simpler end of each of the dimensions is where you find the big data projects, not always, but the big, the big science projects that I was talking about. I think the, com the, the, the distinguishing characteristic, when I look at a table like this, the distinguishing characteristic of, uh, of non-big uh, science projects, so the pro of, the, of the data science issues in, in biology and the humanities and so on, the distinguishing characteristic is the complexity. I think uh, the uh, uh, big data issues are, are really issues of complexity. In, in handling new, new kinds of data, sometimes in communities that are, that are not well schooled in that or have no, have no heritage in it. Um, I want to oversimplify now um, uh, data science. And uh, uh, this is a personal uh, Venn diagram, a personal picture of how I would uh, classify the different important aspects of uh, data science. Um, and the three domains are analytics, interface, and society. And I, uh, analytics is pretty obvious, I think. The interface and society, I, I'll have to describe. But let's start with the analytics. Um, the analytics is how you an analyze the data. And that's something that in, in physics we're, we're comfortable with, and in many other fields the, where there's quantitative data, we're comfortable uh, uh, about it. It tends to be quantitative, although it can be uh, um, uh, analytics of text data and so on. Um, the purpose of the analysis is to inform you about your data set, to discover uh, information that you may not have found, that you may not have realized was there, and in the end, to assign meaning uh, to, that, uh, 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 to that data set or to the conclusions you're drawing from the data set. And as I mentioned before, I, I think it's important to distinguish between just finding correlations and patterns and uh, actually finding uh, a meaning in those patterns, understanding what that's about. Um, it, a lot of big data um, efforts today, and there are, there are big data institutes being set up at different universities uh, around Europe and the United States. Um, Many of these focus on the analytics. That's where the heritage is in, in big science. That's where a lot of the heritage is in computer science. Uh, and so uh, they explicitly focus on the analytics of big data. But I'd like to argue that that's only one of the components of uh, the challenges that are facing the, the, uh, uh, the applications, uh, uh, the application areas that are now uh, being inundated with, with lots of data and lots of data complexity. And um, I think without these other components, without addressing these other components, you um, may not be able to help people solve their problems. So the, the interface uh, issue is, um, there are a number of interfaces here. Uh, one is the human interface. If, uh, if you have inexperienced teams of, of people working with data, they have to be able to use tools that, that they understand and that makes sense to them. So there's a, uh, 
there's a, a human interface, but there's also interfaces between the data themselves and interfaces between uh, the data and the analytics. Um, and uh, so uh, the four bullets that I put up, and I could have put up a lot more bullets to try to illustrate this, but, but there's access to data. So um, uh, access to data includes things like what is the structure of your database? And like I said, there's been a lot of innovative ideas in that uh, uh, recently. Um, there is the use, but, but access also means um, do you have access? Do, do, people, do, do people have uh, uh, the ability to, 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 to get at the data, even if the data isn't uh, explicitly closed off? Where is it held? How is it going to be um, accessed? There's usability, as I mentioned. Um, there's, there's the focus. So you uh, generally have more success analyzing data if you can establish a, some sort of focus, what you're, what you're asking um, your analytics to do. That's part of your interface with your software. Um, and then there's the infrastructure, and that's something that I particularly, uh, that particularly interests me. Infrastructure embodies uh, uh, a lot of things. There's the hardware infrastructure and the transport of data and so on and the storage. But then there's the software infrastructure and, and that includes metadata, that includes questions of um, uh, validity of the data uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, provenance of the data and, and all sorts of things, which I think we don't do a very good job at. One of the things that people often complain about who uh, uh, in, in the new world of, of, of large data sets is that academically we don't reward people who, who focus mostly on handling the data or creating data sets or making data sets available. Uh, we're, we, we still reward academically people who publish papers and get lots of citations in those papers. And um, we don't have a way, a standard way of having a citation, let's say, if you're going to use a data set, having a citation that, that goes to some, to, to give credit to somebody on, uh, when they go up for their academic tenure review or something like that. So uh, there's lots of, there's lots of aspects of the infrastructure that are, that are um, inadequate and they're not help, they're, they're, they uh, are, are inhibiting uh, people from uh, spending an adequate amount of time on making data sets available. So that's something that I think um, uh, has had less attention in this, uh, in this field, uh, particularly from the big uh, 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 data institutes. Um, and then the third part of my Venn diagram, the third aspect that I'd like to emphasize, uh, which I've called society, is, is really the social aspects of, uh, of data. Because a lot of the data um, uh, analysis, a lot of the treatments of big data uh, involve large teams. So there's, uh, so there's the, the social aspects of how people interact with each other and how they are going to interact with each other as they as they handle this data. And as I said, the physics, the big science projects have understood that. There's a heritage, but, they've, but that's a heritage of growing from small teams of 20 up to teams of 100 and then up to teams of 1,000. Um, and building their structures and their, their, their assumptions and their ways of working together. Those kinds of social interactions are, are foreign in many, in many um, other research areas. But then there's other aspects of the, so, the social question, which is, Clearly, privacy. A lot of the data um, uh, needs to be stripped of um, uh, uh, information that would allow you to go back and identify the individual, or if you don't want to do that, if it's important to identify the individual person from that the data refers to, then it has to be very secure. Um, there's copyright. A lot of science, most science, is international these days, and it's surprising what the differences are between uh, copyright law in, in different countries. The EU and the, and, and the US have quite different ideas of, of copyright and, and protection. And sometimes that inhibits uh, the access to data and exchange of data, or people just ignore it and, and hope for the best. Um, the uh, accessibility of the data is, is again, um, an issue, a social issue more than a physics issue. We, we can build networks, but, can, but, uh, but there's a lot of data that isn't available. Um, 
And there's authenticity. And uh, when data is open and when data is downloaded, you want to you want to be able to assure people using the data that it really that the copy that they get really is the same data as they started with, and that it's reproducible and, and so on. Um, so there's lots of uh, uh, again issues that are to do with um, the way people work together and our reward systems uh, and so on, which come into um, data science. And so from my point of view, that's that's where uh, uh, the, the, if, if one wants to address all of these, if one wants to address data science issues and help people who have um, uh, problems and are, are trying to make, make way in these fields with, with new data challenges, one has to have a broader view than just the analytics. And so that, that's, um, that point of view has informed the, the, the new institute that Ed mentioned uh, that we're starting in Cardiff. It's called the Data Innovation Institute. Uh, and it's just starting up now. Uh, I, we don't have a physical location yet. We will by the end of this, by the end of this year. Um, and uh, I, when I go back to Cardiff now, I have to, have to finish the final budget negotiations and so on. But I'm very enthusiastic about this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, institute. It's been a in preparing the ground for it, I've had, it's been a great opportunity for me to talk to people in all the different areas within a university that are dealing with big data. And I'm sure Cardiff is, is by no means atypical. Um, I'm, I'm sure if you walked around this, this university or any other large university, you'd, you'd find um, really interesting data problems all over the place. And I mentioned uh, in Cardiff, there's the brain research, there's also people doing genetics uh, and there are projects involving data for policing and crime. There are projects um, involving government delivery of government services and so on. There's architects are working with engineers on intelligent buildings, and all of these are, are um, uh, data-driven um, applications. Uh, in the computer science area within Cardiff, there's been a, a there's a, a, a strong computer science department. And it has people who've worked in relevant uh, research in, in interest, but there's been no systematic attempt up till now to sort of bring things together. So um, the institute, ha the university, uh, will be putting in, uh, will be creating some new faculty positions, about ten new faculty positions. In addition, we'll have secondments from different uh, um, uh, departments. We'll have some internal fellowships where people can under can come to us for, let's say, a year. From, from their normal uh, position inside the univer university and, and um, get some experience, build some contacts, understand what, what uh, is really going on. And we're going to provide services in terms of university-wide uh, seminars. We're not going to provide a, a service in terms of a help desk. We're not going to be taking people coming in and, 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 and saying, I've got this problem. What's the software I should be using? That's not the function of this uh, institute. The function of the institute is to do fundamental research that comes out of some of these areas. We want people to come to us from these areas and say, I have this problem, and then we have to recognize whether that's just a problem that they can solve with some, some existing kind of techniques, or whether it's a real um, foundational challenge. And if it's a foundational challenge, then we want to be working on it. And the faculty appointments are going to be distributed among the, these, these different areas that I was talking about on the previous slide. We're not all. Uh, we're not going to have ten uh, uh, appointments in analytics. We're going to have people who um, uh, will be appointed in in um, the uh, arts faculty and people who will be appointed in the um, uh, in the biological sciences faculty and and so on. So we're we're going to be um, bringing together people uh, in in different places in that Venn diagram under one roof. And we're going to be doing the usual things that you want to do. You want to have relationships with uh, industry and with in Europe. A lot of the money for big data is, is Europe-wide and is uh, available if you enter into the consortia. And we want international partners. And that's one of the things I would like to see. Uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm visiting Ed here is we would like to see what the, champ what the opportunities are for uh, um, uh, cooperation in areas like this between NCSA and, uh, and the new institute in Cardiff.
And I just want to mention something that maybe some of you already know about, uh, but is, is certainly going to color the, uh, the way big data is, is handled, uh, big data research is handled in the UK. They've announced in the last month or so, um, the, the UK government has announced the Turing Institute. Um, the Turing Institute is, a, uh, is going to be a physically, is, 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 is a physical institute that is going to be set up. There's a lot of money, like 60 million pounds being put in from, uh, central, uh, from the central government. Um, but they want to involve universities, and so they are inviting universities to bid to become uh, uh, partners in the Turing Institute. And to, uh, and to become a partner, you have to put money in. You have to put up at least five million pounds from the university to get into this uh, operation. And the idea, I think, is, is, not, is not to have a huge staff wherever the, the Turing Institute is located. There will be people. Um, working on data science and at, at the level of the, at the professorial level down to the postdoctoral level. But it's also going to be a place which coordinates research programs around the UK. And so um, I, I think if you're working with UK partners in, um, in data science questions, then it's very likely that in a couple of years those partners are going to be looking for how their, the work that they're doing with you can be fit into the, uh, some of the programs that are given priority in the Turing Institute. So the Turing Institute will, will, will be set up in about a year, and uh, uh, the government is, is very keen on it. And I think with, with a consortium of, of universities, um, the, uh, uh, the chances are it'll have a long lifetime because um, uh, the universities will, will be expected to keep keep uh, um, investing uh, a certain amount of money in it. The, the current horizon is just up until about 2020, but I'm, I'm sure it'll, it'll last much longer than that. Um, and so um, I, I can say watch, watch this space. We're, we're uh, going to be setting up the Data Innovation Institute. We're going to be try, trying to uh, coordinate ourselves with the Turing Institute. And um, I'm sure we'll be linking ourselves with some of the programs in, in that. But at the same time, um, we, we have our own view. And I'm not sure how, what the Turing Institute is going to prioritize, but we have our own view about how we should go forward with, uh, with new research in data science. And it's such a big, big, as Ed said, it's such a big amorphous uh, area right now that I think um, with some, some creative ideas, there's plenty of scope for people to, to work on these things. So I'll stop there. And can have some discussion. Thanks, Bernie. So, questions? Victoria. Do you have a sense of some of the key foundational questions or sort of targeted research areas that you're going to be addressing first in the center? Have you seen, you know, researchers sort of come to you with interesting issues or there's sort of some in the back of your mind? Um, I think it's a, uh, I do have some, uh, uh, area, some questions that I find very interesting. But um, uh, we're also going to be driven by, by the interests of the new faculty that we hire. And so... I wouldn't want to be too prescriptive at this point in, in that. Uh, but we are going to be looking at um, some key areas. One of the areas that uh, uh, I'm very interested in, and I think you know, is, is in this whole area of metadata and, and uh, um, uh, provenance of data and things like that. And so I would like to start something up. And I think there's, there's a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of opportunity there for, for creating systems in which people can bind things together. Um, I think another area that we're, we're almost certainly going to be working in is, is privacy. I think uh, there are people in our, our humanities and the law area at Cardiff who are very interested that we hire somebody in that. Um, we're certainly going to be looking at areas uh, that are where problems are generated by, by genetics. That's a, that's a very big uh, uh, research interest at the medical school in Cardiff. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, they're particularly interested in, in 
kind of tools for data mining in, in genetics information. So we'll probably be, be looking to see if there's something new we can do in that. But beyond that, I don't want to say anything too specific. We're open to whatever. We're looking for the best possible people we can find. So your, your slide with the three rings of analytics interface and society, that, that was really intriguing. Um, and I can think of lots of um, places, research institutes that you know, are world famous for analytics. Um, can you give us some pointers to places or people who um, are focusing on interface or society? Um, I, I, I don't know that I, that I know of institutes that focus on, on either of those two places, but I do know of it, that, that this idea that you should have these three areas is not just something that uh, uh, has popped out of my head, that other people are thinking too. Um, I'll give you two examples. One is, is uh, at um, uh, Johns Hopkins, um, Alex Saleh, who's an astronomer who we know very well, who, who set up the Galaxy Zoo project that I talked about. He's building a big data institute with a similar sort of scale to about 10 faculty or something like that. And I was talking with him recently and, and we just, you know, sort of, we were thinking about the same things. It's, it's uh, clear that to him as well that you need a wider scope than analytics. Um, and I was very interested also, I, I was probing um, uh, HPC companies and uh, I began talking with Xerox uh, 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 research labs in Europe, their European research um, uh, facility is in Grenoble in France. And uh, uh, I sent a preliminary document to them was outlining this sort of philosophy. And I got a letter back saying, that's just what we do. That's exactly what we want. And we don't have enough people in house, so we want to work with people. But, but that sort of scope, these are very important. And I, I think for commercial firms that are producing software that has to be used and, and are not just interested in, in getting academic credit for doing something really brilliant uh, on uh, in one piece of the problem, but they, they want a whole package that has to be used. They do have to pay attention to all of these things, otherwise it doesn't work. I had a question on nuts and bolts, kind of. Uh, what kind of sizes, what kind of data sizes are you trying to put on the floor and petabytes, exabytes, that type of thing? Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't imagine we're going to, as an institute, have a huge amount of data uh, storage in-house. We'll, we'll have some petabytes, but we're not going to um, uh, go for very huge things. We, um, uh, uh, we want to work on problems that are generated by our partners within the university, and they will have their own data facilities that, uh, uh, or they may have, there's an HPC center on the, on the campus and they may be storing data there already. Um, but we, um, uh, we expect that we'll be working with smaller amounts of data and, and trying out, proving our principles or, or, or being able to do our research that way. And then, and then exporting those solutions to the people who really have the data that, that they're storing for their own purposes. So something you said just now uh, was very interesting where you described the Xerox research centers in Europe responding basically to market pressures to focus on interfaces. Do you think that it's possible for existing institutions inside academia as opposed to a new institution that's being developed specifically to focus on things like analytics, interface, and society, do you think that existing institutions will begin to have to respond to market pressure in a similar way or do you think that that's not going to be? That's an interesting question. I, I mean. It, I hadn't thought of it in terms of market pressure, but uh, but in 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 the Data Innovation Institute in Cardiff, we have a kind of market pressure in that the money for this institute is being provided by the university itself, and they want it to benefit the research of the university. So we're we're serving a, a market, which is the the people who who inside the university have big data problems that they can't handle, um, uh, or they want, or they just want to be one step ahead of everybody else that they're competing with. Um, and um, uh, so that, that is true of any university. So there are a number of universities where, where people are stitching together existing activities on, in big data. So in one that I know about is University College London. They've set up a, uh, a big data a center that's actually funded by Elsevier, the, the publisher. Um, uh, 
when I look at it, I don't see a coherence. I don't see the sort of fundamental plan uh, built up from the beginning. But it could be that, that the people are sufficiently spread out around areas that they'll evolve some sort of um, uh, picture like that. So it would be possible to retrofit that, I think, in a university. But you'd, I guess you do want to you do want to have some incentive to serve a, a community or to, to, or to have customers or some, some demand, yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking about any new educational curricula that undergraduate or graduate students that will be associated with the institute? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for suggesting that I should. <laughs> We are, are uh, so far, we, we are, um, we have thought about the graduate students in the sense uh, that um, uh, the graduate students uh, typically will be funded by, uh, by research grants that are held by, by the faculty who are working in the center. Um, but um, uh, we want particularly to, uh, uh, to work for, for a number of the graduate students, we want to have them placed in two places at once. We want to have them with one foot in an application area and one foot in the institute. So when we identify a partner, uh, let's say the, the people doing brain research or whatever, um, in, in uh, uh, the institute, uh, in, within the university, then we want to get graduate students who will be able to understand what's going on in our area. There are graduate students, but they will be spending a lot of time in the brain research um, area, so they understand that, that problem, but they can also be a, a conduit for transferring information. So that, that part of it we kind of, we believe strongly, but we haven't really thought um, anything sort of in a terms of a curriculum or anything. Maybe one last question, or perhaps two. Okay, go ahead. It's okay, but we'll do two. Okay, <laughs> one, um, one more. Sorry. Um, you mentioned uh, the Galaxy Zoo as an example of citizen science and uh, data analysis, and I just wondered, are there any other examples that you know of or projects that are sort of in the works um, that would engage people outside of research communities in data analysis and not just their machines? Oh. Um, there are a number of, of these citizen science projects. Um, uh, um, do you, uh, I'm trying to think of one. I'm also drawing blanks, but there are yeah, lots of there them. Are I don't lots know of why. Them, actually, yeah. you can't do. Yes, yeah, there you go. That's yeah. right. That was but a very example. important one. I guess yeah. I'm I'm, ta I'm not talking about you know as a screensaver, but yeah. people who are people are really active. Yeah. Um, there, there are under the Zooniverse, yeah, there are a number of these where, where people actually intervene and... and uh, yeah. They're great examples where, I, I, in some of my talks, I, I sh I've talked about this person, Kathy Gray, who was at, at 10 years old, had discovered a supernova because data sets, she's a Canadian, were made available publicly. Uh, and it turned out, uh, I just learned that her brother, um, at age nine, a couple of years later, also discovered a supernova. So <laughs> there are a number of these things going on. <laughs> So I wanted to quickly follow up on Matt's question on your Venn diagram. So for, I guess, uh, the, the establishment is that the analytics of the data science has been fairly dominated by academia. And these really two other aspects of interface and society are now mostly, let's say, dominated by Google and Facebook, right? Because they to are- To some extent, that's- To some, ex to right, some extent. I don't think that think I'm you know, going too far saying that. Uh, do you think that it's actually possible or to the benefit of academia to really go into this domain, or actually if we even have a chance of really going into this domain, that for us is, uh, so we've been, academia has been really ruling the analytics, and probably what we will, we will need to go on, the, the, the space that we need to try to conquer are really those interfaces, uh, with, you know, most of with society. So that's, that's my question. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a valid question. Um, the, uh, I mentioned earlier the, that we don't have appropriate reward systems in our uh, academic world for people who works on, on some of these uh, areas, particularly on, let's say, access, usability, and so on. If you're maintaining a database, you don't get the re academic reward. Um, that is actually one of the things that <coughs> is, is in the, 
uh, on a list of, uh, of, of points for, of, of negotiation that I have with, with the university uh, in setting up this institute. I want to make sure that we have um, a recognition uh, system for people in, 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 the, in this institute, which uh, isn't tied just to how many citations they get or, or, or something like that. But I think it's, it really is a, uh, an issue. I think academics have a lot to, to offer because I think, as I said, with, if you leave it to Google uh, uh, and even if you leave it to Xerox and, uh, and so on, you'll get um, solutions that are not interoperable, they're not very, uh, uh, they, they don't respect sort of some of the priorities that we would have in, the, in academic disciplines. And yet I think those aspects of things are very important for the academic projects. So, so the people doing brain research or genetics or something, they have problems that, that with, with, with very important aspects there. So the important thing is to, is to link the solutions that we find to the success of those projects um, uh, when, when we can put our solutions back into those domains. And so that's what we, we're, we, you, you, I'm, you probably want to bring this to an end, but, I, but I, I'm, I'm uh, you're, you, you've triggered something else, which is a favorite hobby horse of mine, which, which is that if you look back on the history of, the recent history of uh, uh, computer tool development, computer science development of tools of various kinds uh, on the web and so on. There have been a lot of really clever things that have been done that have gone really nowhere because there were no users or there was an inadequate number of users. And I think many of them were developed without cooperation of users. Uh, so on the one hand, you have the, Google is a huge user and they're doing just what they want. On the other hand, you, a lot of times you have academic developments which are decoupled completely from users and where there's a lot of very interesting stuff. And you wonder why it's not being used, but it's because it never found a use case. And so we're trying to be somewhere in the middle in this institute. We want to work closely with our uh, university partners and make sure we have a use case, make sure that they come to us with something that says, we have a real problem here and we say, ah, we think we can do something clever. Um, and, and that feeds back into there. And, and if we can get that kind of, if we can get credit for, the, for, the, for what we've done for them, then I think the answer is that uh, it is rewarding. Okay, well let's, uh, let's thank Bernie again. <laughs>